everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Two World Podcast. I will get us started today, and of course, my name is Barney, and I am joined with my co-host today, and he is... Jacob! And this month, uh, September, is when we're uh, uh, doing today's episode, in Japan, we always have a holiday on the third Monday. And it is uh, respect for the aged day, or I guess respect for the aged day, maybe. I believe also maybe in the West um, around this time is when they have Grandparents Day. And um, when I was, when when Grandparents Day kind of first started to become popularized or attempted to be, so I think people kind of met it thinking that maybe it was some kind of made up thing. But um, I believe that it probably was inspired by what we have here um, in Japan and in other um, Eastern cultures that um, respect, you know, make sure to go out of their way, probably due to um, maybe Confucian influences and other influences to, um, you know, show expressed respect for um, the elderly people around them. If they are um, members of their neighborhood, um, members, of course, of their family. Um, and it is revered so much that it's actually a day off. So we don't have to go to work that day, don't have to go to school. And um, even kids like uh, my oldest son, they um, they write letters or write postcards and, and send them to their grandparents. So we thought that it would be a good time, a good topic while we're still in September, um, just barely, to um, talk about um, the relationships that we've had uh, to the, the people who are older than us maybe a generation or two older than us uh, in our own families, and um, maybe that are around that kind of gap, um, age-wise, um, wisdom-wise, um, with the uh, other relationships that we have um, beyond that today. And um, I'd like to get us started by just asking Jacob, um, you know, how, were, how close were you? How much um, time, you know, did you always, did you get to have with your grandparents when, when you were growing up? Well, Barney, I was in a fortunate situation to live next door to one of my grandmothers as she had a regular presence in my life and would invite me over to her house uh, to spend the night. And then in the morning when I'd wake up, there would be this wonderful aroma that would come from the downstairs kitchen of bacon. And I, I remember always being, coming down and being drawn to that aroma and saying, oh, grandma, it smells so good. And she would make me bacon and eggs and toast and um, was, was always so uh, generous with, with serving me delicious food. And um, it was really interesting because she was in many ways a um, very nurturing figure, but at the same time, she was a firecracker. And she had this edge to, uh, <laughs> to her style of being a grandparent that if you kind of stepped out, I wouldn't say stepped out of line, but if you, if you weren't considerate about something that she um, did not mince words. And I remember one time I was staying with her and I left her house um, without saying goodbye or thank you, which I mean, thinking back on it, I don't know what I was thinking. I just, I just left. And the next morning I was standing out front with a bunch of the neighbor kids waiting for the school bus to come. And she came over and um, in front of everybody, let me have it, you know, shame on you, Jacob, you should know better than to leave your grandmother's house without thanking her, your poor grandmother who was worrying all night, not knowing if you were safe. <laughs> you should never do that again. And, um, and I felt so embarrassed, but I also felt very badly. So I did, of course, apologize to her, but, um, but that was just uh, one small example. There's so many other examples of, 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 of fun things that we did together. She used to like to make mints and uh, she would pull them on this a metal hook that she had um, in this fireplace. She would pull it out. Um, it would kind of swing out um, and you could sit with a chair in front of the fireplace. And then she would heat up the, the materials till they were real elastic and gummy. And then she would just pull them in over and over again and stretch them out and then cut them with the scissors. And then they would dry and harden and um, cool down and harden. And so I have so many memories like that. Um, she had this huge station wagon. She was a real small person of small stature, but um, she had this huge vehicle. And I remember her driving me into town 
um, so I could buy comic books. <laughs> Me being so excited, and uh, there she was, you know, with with her hands on the wheel, like kind of sitting low, and just driving through all the traffic. And but it was as I look back on it, it was really kind of her because it was a little stressful for her sometimes driving around in the later years. Um, uh, and I have a picture of her this morning that I'd like to share for those who are watching the video. And so I'm going to go ahead and um, share that now. Um, here. Let me see here. Um, uh, this is a picture of her with her um, uh, kindergarten aged kids. She loved children and th throughout her life, she would be involved with daycare, mm -hmm. preschool, um, Sunday school, um, kindergarten, uh, kind of being a teacher's aide and um, in many ways, children were a passion of her life, and she had this gift for um, relating to children. And a lot of times, um, without even knowing a child, she would just start talking to them and telling them stories. And before too long, they would come and sit on her lap. Oh, and wow. she used to love to read books to kids and make popcorn and take it with her. And she had this um, wooden slat that she would sit on and it would protrude forward. And then she had this little kind of puppet horse and she could, um, with one hand, um, flick the edge of the slat and would go up and down. It would make the horse, uh, its legs bounce off of the, the wood. Like it was trotting along and she would tell stories like, um, so that is a very long, um, explanation to your initial question. Did I have close relationship yeah. with grandparents? Yes, very much so especially with this grandparent, um, my grandmother on my dad's side. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate to also have a relationship with um, other grandparents on my mom's side. And I will talk about that in a little bit, but I need to stop mm -hmm. and give you a chance to weigh in on this. <laughs> and so what is your experience with grandparents? And um, did you have an opportunity to meet any of your grandparents? Yeah, your a lot of your story sounded very familiar to me. Um, my my mom's folks uh, lived in Orville, as as you know, so um, not too far, uh, not 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 as blessed as being next door, but but never too far away. And um, instead of having memories of making mints, I had memories of um, also cooking with uh, with my mom's mom with my grandma. Um, and uh, one thing we did was uh, we would always do cookies, but we often in the wintertime would do caramels. And um, it was so neat because she had this one, you know, real sturdy wooden spoon that was just a real trooper and made it year after year. And so much stirring and stirring and stirring that you have to do that it was even, um, you know, like ang on an angle from being worn down from all the stirring over all of the years of, of, of caramel making. And um, I, I in, in my case, I was the youngest. And um, I, my memories of my grandparents are always from when they were quite a bit older. And um, I, I had the benefit of benefit, or at least I at least had the benefit of hearing um, my siblings' memories um, of, the, of, uh, of our grandparents. And um, actually, I didn't think I had a picture to show, but I can show one picture of um, of my mom's uh, dad. Um, and this is actually, this is not me on the riding lawnmower. This is Jay. And That is a um, great picture. I love yeah, that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And of course, that's at the house that you know so well. Yes. And it's got the simplicity tractor. And um, I, I, when my, all of my memories of, um, of this grandpa were when he was, I think, starting to struggle through dementia. So it wasn't so, um, I had a lot of trouble kind of relating to, to him, um, you know, that I remember. But um, hearing the stories from my siblings and of course from my mom and even my dad. Um, and then when I would spend time at um, Orpha Mennonite and see like um, his name on a parking spot and that he was the trustee there for a long time. You know, I got the sense of what, wow, what a really wonderful person he really must have been, um, you know, just the years before I met him and, and, and before then. 
And um, even though it seemed like he had kind of a tough childhood growing up, I think that one of his parents, uh, maybe his dad passed away and he was left to support um, a lot of the family growing up. Um, he also had this side to him, I guess, where um, he dreamt of owning a motorcycle. And um, my mom's mom who grew up, um, I guess uh, maybe her dad was Amish, so she didn't necessarily grow up Amish, but kind of from that background, um, was always a little bit stern and made certain that, that that dream, sadly, maybe, or maybe wisely, never went fulfilled. Um, but uh, these these memories I had, yeah, uh, maybe since, since um, my mom's mom, since my grandma wasn't so far away, most of my memories are, are of her. And, um, and yeah, kind of thinking back to our bread episode of, you know, cooking together and baking together, things like that. And I had a few times where I spent the night at her house and um, uh, yeah, she would always have her thing that she loved making uh, was uh, cornmeal mush. And um, I was so glad for that and always glad when my mom would, would use the same recipe and make that too. Um, how about, how about, um, your, your, other, the other side of the family, were, were your mom's folks equally nearby or not too far away distance wise? Uh, they were further away. Um, they lived in, um, Fairfax County, Virginia and Annandale. Mm -hmm. And, um, this is a picture of my, my grandfather, um, with my mom and with me when I was in mm -hmm. middle school. And um, they were very warm and welcoming. And we would see them several times a year, normally around Christmas time. Definitely that was a sure thing, always like a Christmas mm -hmm. time visit over that break. But then sometimes also in the summer, there were a number of family reunions and other family gatherings that they would attend. And um, they would come to us sometimes, but we mostly went mm -hmm. to their house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember um, just so vividly my grandfather's uh, style of relating to us. When we first would come, he had all these things he wanted us to read. And he would, he mm -hmm. would, we would sit down and he would pass out these sheets of paper <laughs> and he would say, I want you to read this. Now, Jacob, read this. Now, go ahead. And um, a lot of it centered around the, the steps of recovery, um, the the 12 step program developed by Alcoholics Anonymous, and then also used for Al-Anon, which is uh, support for family mm -hmm. members of alcoholics, because my grandmother had struggled for a time mm -hmm. um, in her earlier years uh, with um, alcoholism. And mm -hmm. it was, it was because in part, um, my grandfather was in the military and they traveled a lot and there were these ex and she would go as well um, with him and, um, but there was an expectation they would go to these social events and there was a lot of drinking and she hadn't really been yeah, yeah. around alcohol yeah. growing up. And mm -hmm. it just kind of became a, something that surprised her as she, she got more into that rhythm of life that she didn't realize she had a sensitivity to that. And, but anyway, long story short, um, in later years, they, they both had like a conversion experience. Um, and for my grandmother, what that translated into was like a complete reversal of her desire to drink. And she never drank another uh, glass of, of beer or wine or anything for the rest of her life after that experience. That was it. It was completely a complete sobriety. Um, and she felt like um, for her, it was like a transforming moment in her life. And she didn't really struggle after that. But for my grandfather, um, he had lived so many years um, with her in that place that he wanted to go through the Al-Anon pro program, but it ended up being like the best thing that could have ever happened because it, um, it helped him get in touch with um, his own spiritual journey and have a deeper faith. And so anyway, long story short, we would go and he would pass out this literature that was like, were lessons that he was learning. Um, things like, um, you know, live one day at a time. Um, one minute at a time. And he even adapted it to say one second at a time. And I, I was like, boy, grandpa, that, that is a lot of intense, you know, um, <laughs> mindfulness there. Um, and then he had other pithy little st statements of wisdom about um, uh, 
how our our um, thoughts relate to our attitudes, and our attitudes are shaped by our our um, habits and our habits become our character and our character becomes our reality. He had all these, you know, ways of, of basically phrasing um, the importance of, of growth, personal growth and life, spiritual growth and how to be wise as you live life. Um, so uh, having been in the military, he had been, he had achieved a rank of, um, of uh, Colonel. So he was used to people um, being under his authority and so I saw this gradual transformation um, and, you know, I knew them probably like my grandmother passed away when I was 17 and my grandfather passed away when I was 26. So um, I got to see their, um, their relationship evolve, at least in the period that I was around. And um, my grandmother got to this point where she, she was willing to assert her own autonomy um, and I remember very vividly this one time we went to visit them and he passed out some of his, his quotes and we were reading quotes and she says, I have something that I would like for you all to see. And we're like, oh yeah. And she went into the back room and she came out with her own paper and she passed it out and we started reading it. And they were like these amazing life insights and stories and anecdotes. And she had never told him that she was recording these and she had collected somewhere like between 30 and 40 of these. And he's like, what, where are these from? Where did you get that from? And it was such a beautiful moment because the tables were turned and then she was able to display that she had a lot of life wisdom. And um, it was just, um, it was wonderful. And we ended up sharing those, um, those bits of wisdom at um, her memorial service. We had them printed out really nicely and passed them out to people. And it was something that, um, that even my grandpa, Don integrated into the content he loved and he cherished after she passed away because um, she preceded him by about like nine years, around nine years. Um, so, but anyway, um, the other thing I want to say is that um, my, my grandma was very generous and I used to get so excited because we'd go around Christmas time and she loved to spoil me and she'd say, I'm going to take my grandson shopping and we would go to Toys R Us. And I remember I would get so excited when I would come in the door that I got into this habit of like greeting my grandma and then being like, when are we going to go shopping grandma? So my mom had to be like, Jacob, don't ask about shopping right away. You know, um, like just wait until she initiates. But um, she was always very um, gracious about that. And, and sometimes when you have um, somebody be so extravagant towards you, um, it, it can just be, it can just be very special and you carry it with you throughout life. And she's one of those people that just lavish that sense of wanting to bless me and, and that way. And, um, and she too, like my other grandma would make bacon when I'd wake up and bacon and eggs and toast. And so, um, so yeah, I, I think, um, after her passing, it was nice to still have my grandfather, um, the night before I got married, um, I stayed with him in the hotel and he gave me marriage advice. Um, and he gave me the five love languages book, um, which is something I still use when I meet with couples who are getting ready for marriage. It was really a good choice for something to pass on to me. And so I'll always cherish the memory of the night before talking with my grandpa and then the next morning getting up and he said, you want to do some of my exercises? He had these morning exercises. He do it. So we're there rolling around on the floor, stretching, and he's giving me more marriage advice. And, um, so, um, yeah, he, he was an incredible character and, and all of my grandparents were, um, but it was so neat that I, I had him in that um, moment. And um, one final thing I'll say is when grandparents meet each other from across families, that is also interesting. And I had mentioned before that my grandmother who lived near us um, was a firecracker. And I remember one time my grandpa from my mom's side um, came to visit and, uh, he was giving some advice to my grandmother on my dad's side in the kitchen. And she, <laughs> without taking a beat, turned and, 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 and furled her eyebrows and said, now, Don, this is my kitchen. And when I'm in the kitchen, I'll make the food. How I want to make the food. And, and he was so caught up. But he said, oh, oh, okay, Rosemary, no, uh, no trouble here. I, I understand. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so um, it was just funny when you have two strong personalities and seeing how they um, they come together and s- sparks can fly, but there's still a lot of love there, a hundred percent. But yeah, so um, thanks for asking about that. Um, uh, you had mentioned before how you learned um, about your grandparents partly through the experience of others, hearing your siblings mm-hmm. talk about your grandparents. Um, I wonder if you could unpack just a little bit more of what it's like to learn about somebody through stories. And then after you share about that, I have a story to share, uh, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. So. yeah. 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 Um, I, I guess it, in, in my case, it, especially when hearing about, um, my, my mom said it, maybe it made me a little jealous, um, because I never had the chance to get to know him like that. Um, and I don't know if this is necessarily related, but, but the one memory that sticks out so much for me with, um, with, with that grandfather is actually, um, at his funeral where, um, I, I just remember as, as clear now as it was then at, at Orville Mennonite and my mom was giving a speech about her dad. And, and that was the first time that I could remember her seeing her cry so much like that. And, um, and it really made kind of what I was saying earlier, it made me realize what, how, what a great person he must have been. And, and I felt, I felt this point, I think even then, and then when I heard stories again, occasionally that would come up here and there where someone was reminded of something about him as I, as I was older and, and thinking, oh, wow, you know, what a really interesting person that he must have really been. And, um, and yeah, it was really too bad that um, that you know he he was struggling with the, the you know I don't know if it's okay to say he got sick, but you know just working through dementia and whatnot that they kind of really took something that's special away from him. Um, and it was always interesting thinking about how um, you know he passed away at, at um, eighty, and we we always we always were reminded of the one verse in the Bible saying how how great person. Um, you know, lives until 80. And, and it was just kind of one more neat thing to attach to that. But um, in, in a way, hearing stories about um, grandparents uh, also applied in my dad's dad's case. Um, he, I think, was the youngest of 12 or 13 kids in his family. And so he, he ended up playing with his nieces and nephews, like they were his, you know, friends, um, because they were around the same age. And um, there was even a book written about his family. And um, getting to read that book, and then kind of hear my dad's stories of of him was so neat too. you know, um, I think they said that from from that side of the family, you know, they also grew up in, in Virginia, and um, the men and the family were either farmers or they were Mennonite preachers. And, um, and my dad's dad went the route to farming. And then when his, when my dad's oldest brother was old enough to take over the farm, then he started driving truck and, um, heard all these neat stories from there. And usually he would deliver the cargo or whatever to one place and then fly back. And, um, Muhammad Ali was living in Indiana at that time. And, a number of times they ended up on the same flight home and oh, you wow. know, just, yeah. Right. And you know, you always hear these stories about Muhammad Ali doing um, magic tricks and then not wanting to fool people. So, ex- you know, telling, telling them how it's done, you know, like kind of being honest with them. And, and, you know, my grandfather, um, you know, I heard kind of secondhand, these kind of stories he had of these run-ins with him. And it just sounded like he's just, you know, a regular guy's guy talking with just anybody. And, um, so all, I always felt like all these things happened kind of before I was really aware. And then I didn't know my grandparents until they were much older. And, um, I really cherished those times that I had with them then, but, um, it sounded like, you know, my, my siblings, you know, really kind of got to have a, kind of this like separate extra time with them that I, I didn't really have the chance to experience. Yeah, that's, that's uh, interesting. And um, it's, it's meaningful too to think about um, 
the idea of, of passing on story as um, a sense of connection um, and identity. Um, you could be connected to the grandparents you didn't know as well through the stories and through your family's collective memories of them. But there is, like you said, an element of sorrow with that or, mm. or regret or loss, like in that you weren't able to experience it firsthand. And um, I can relate to that a lot. And I wanted to share something about that, if I may. And mm. um, I just do that real quick here. I'm going to pull up um, something very interesting that happened um, about, I want to say maybe five years ago, perhaps somewhere around there, mm. five or six. Um, mm -hmm. there was an article in the Washington, Pennsylvania newspaper, mm -hmm. um, titled an old fashioned Christmas mystery. And in that article, there is a photograph of, uh, two boys and a dog in a house and with trivets on the wall. Mm -hmm. And the article was saying, this is a mystery photo. We found a, or a number of uh, negatives were donated to this Observer Reporter newspaper, and um, they didn't know who to attribute the photos to. They didn't know who had taken them. And um, so somebody saw this article. I think it was uh, good friends of our family. Maybe it was Linda Bordley is her, her name and her husband, Paul Bordley, who knew my parents for years. And they sent me this article because they recognized right away my dad and my uncle George in the photo. Right. And, um, and so they said, look, like they said, this is a mystery photo, but that's clear your, your dad and your uncle. So um, when I saw it, I was really excited. So I went into our family photo albums and I was able to find um, uh, other photos from the same night that this photo was oh, taken. Wow. And I was wow. able to find another photo uh, from a different angle of the same picture of my dad and my uncle and this dog in this room. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And I, I, um, I scanned it. I sent it to the observer reporter, to the, mm. the person who had put out the inquiry, who was writing this article. And I also sent a picture of my grandfather and I let him know that my grandfather was an amateur photographer. Mm. Um, and I, I, here's the picture that I sent to him. Oh, wow. He was an electrical engineer, but, um, in his free time and as a passion of his, he would do wedding photos and other photos. And so um, uh, they were able then to contact my uncle and interview him about that experience, oh, wow. about the dog that they had at the time, um, <laughs> what my what my grandfather was like uh, as a photographer. I had never met him because he died just months before I was born. Mm -hmm. I was born in August and he died just a few months before me in 1980. Um, but, um, this was one of those rare gifts where, um, somebody, um, uh, sought information about this person that I had never known, but who uh, was a very special person. And so mm -hmm. through this uh, article, then in the follow-up, I was able to learn more about my grandfather. Some of his story was shared more broadly with people in Washington, Pennsylvania. It was a chance for me to talk with my uncle over the phone. We had a long conversation. I called him and said, isn't that crazy how this happened? And it was also a very nice tribute to my dad who had passed away um, just a few years prior. And it was a gift. And so I suppose uh, one of the thoughts I have about um, of learning about our grandparents through stories is yes, mm -hmm. it is hard. There is a sense of loss um, in the distance that we feel that we didn't experience the events directly, but it is also a gift to be able to hear the stories mm -hmm. and to share the stories because they, they communicate at least some, some aspect uh, of who that person was. Um, and interestingly enough, one follow-up, this um, author of the articles um, sent me a, a collection of all these negatives that were digitized and I was able to see all these photos that my grandfather had taken and I didn't realize uh -huh. he was a huge cinema buff uh, he took probably a hundred photos um, of different displays and cinemas around the Washington Pennsylvania area he loved going in and taking pictures of the the art um, you know promoing new films that were coming out and he loved taking pictures outside them he, he took all kinds of pictures around Washington Pennsylvania just of buildings and people and so he really loved the area where they lived and so I felt like through the photos somehow I was learning just a little bit more about him which um, felt very special and and meaningful mm -hmm. yeah when when I listened to 
these amazing stories and um, kind of the the real va- kind of varied background that it seems like your grandparents had, um, and especially hearing about your um, your mom's dad, I, I hadn't really had I haven't really had much exposure to people who have grown up um, as part of uh, uh, military life and things like that, and and then kind of seeing how. Um, seeing this little part about your grandfather on your um, dad's side, when you think about them and look back, can you kind of see maybe how some of their backgrounds and some of the ways that uh, the the people that they were, how maybe that has influenced you? Yes, definitely. I think that the... um the journey of faith that my grandparents on my mom's side went through um, later in life um, is something that was very well communicated um, through our visits and passed on to me. Um, and I think the spirituality of the, the uh, 12 step program became in a lot of ways, my grandfather's spirituality. And, and I have some um, glimpses of that in my life because of, of it being so transformative for him. I remember he um, really valued the serenity prayer. Um, God grant me the serenity today for the, uh, to know the things that I cannot change, to have the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And he really, really appreciated that. And I remember when you came to visit one time with Kai and we were traveling to Akron to meet with um, a social worker at a refugee resettlement um, agency that in the same building, when we were going in, I don't know if you remember this, there was a little chapel. And in that chapel, there were um, display cases set up for the founders of the 12 step program. And it had originated um, there in that location um, in there in Akron, Ohio. And that was commemorating that. And for me, it was one of those reminders of this heritage. You know, you go through life, sometimes you're more or less mindful of things that are passed on to you. And then certain things will bring them up to the surface. Um, and it was a reminder of that. And um, there, you know, in different seasons in life, living one day at a time can become more or less crucial, depending on what you're going through. It's always a good thing to remember, but but when I've gone through really hard times, I start to understand the wisdom in that more, just taking one day at a time. Um, and it's, it is a very scriptural idea. Jesus even said, don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about it itself. Um, but I, I remember one time too, we had a visitor at Worcester Mennonite um, who had shared with our congregation that, that they had struggled with alcoholism. And during one of the sermons, it was so meaningful to be able to share some of my grandfather's story in the prayers of serenity and um, how God is powerfully at work in, and all of our lives, but in that, in that space of vulnerability uh, and recovery, it is one of those palpable uh, moments where it's, it's very clear that a person depends on God. And it's kind of like the spirit of, um, uh, of the Beatitudes in the new Testament and this, this place where a person is vulnerable and opens up to others around them and up to God um, that really lets transformation happen. And so, yes, I think in a lot of ways, um, my grandparents on my mom's side left me with that sense of um, it's important to be vulnerable and real um, and open to people around you and open to God and to, to take one day at a time. And another thing my grandfather was really big on that I valued, he would talk about making amends. If you've, if you've hurt somebody, um, part of your process of healing should also translate into um, seeking the healing or restoration of others. And if you've hurt someone or injured someone to reach out and to say that you're sorry and try to make amends as best you can. And so that was very valuable. Um, and then I'll say on my, my dad's side, uh, my grandmother, Rosemary, um, I think she had a um, this kind of way of being empathetic um, that really left an impression on me people would come up and talk to her at like the grocery store. And after a while, a conversation would go, go on for some time. And then they would eventually leave. And, you know, it could be me or somebody else who's with her. We'd ask her, you know, Oh, who was that? And she said, I don't know. And she said, would well, you didn't know them? You seem to know them. She's like, yeah, I just, 
and they seemed to want to talk and I opened up to them and she was really good at listening to people and caring for people who were even strangers. And so that left impression with me that's really, it's valuable in all of life. And I would say, since I'm serving in pastoral ministry, especially when you encounter other people, listen to them, empathize with them, try to support them where they are, meet them where they are. And that's a very transforming thing to do, even if they're a stranger, um, or maybe even especially if they're strangers. So yeah, those are some um, life lessons um, and things that I carry that I'm grateful for from them. And um, one final thing I'll mention, and this is just a side note, it's nothing major, but both of my grandfathers were Donald's. And so um, my middle name is Donald. It's, so it's kind of fun to <laughs> um, people, people say, oh, why is your middle name Donald? I can say, well, both my grandfathers were Donald's. And um, that kind of convention translated when we were naming our middle child, Aubrey, with her middle name, which is Pamela, um, that my mother and my wife, Katie's mother, were both Pamela's. And so we could give her the middle name Pamela. So every once in a while, um, part of your heritage from grandparents or, or loved ones is actually a namesake as well. So that's part of my story. Yeah. Um, how about for you? Is there anything that you would say you carry with you that would stem from something passed on from your grandparents? Yeah, I think that um, the one, the one thing that I remembered so well um, about them in general is yeah, how, how involved they were with church and, um, you know, how they really had um, their spiritual life and their life with, you know, devotional life and a lot of their, their daily life was, was um, dedicated to, you know, thinking about God and um, studying about um, studying the Bible and things like that. And I remember being so impressed, you know, my dad's folks um, lived in Indiana. So probably similar to your case um, with your mom's folks that we saw them a few times a year going out there. And then a few times, maybe once or twice a year, they would come to our area. And I always thought about, I always remember so well going to, um, you know, the small man night church where my dad's parents went and no matter what hymn it was that was on, you know, in the bulletin that Sunday, my grandfather never had to open the hymnal. He knew all of the verses and he just sang and sang and sang them. That's and amazing. I, I know. I thought that was so, so impressive. So amazing. And um, I even shared that story with um, uh, the, the church in Yachio. I think that um, somehow I knew that um, I found out that his favorite hymn was uh, Shall We Gather at the River? And um, I shared that story about that, and and they were also also impressed too. And I kind of noticed that uh, um, uh, Tatsuki um, Shiraishi Sensei's um, oldest son, he kind I kind of wondered if maybe he was kind of making an effort from then on to kind of also, um, you know, not look at the hymnal when he was singing too. But um, after that, for my grandfather's one hundredth birthday, um, and I think maybe we can add a link to this maybe in the description. Of, of today's episode, we sang um, that in uh, Japanese for him and was able to share it with him. Um, even in a hundred, you know, where he was with his um, retirement center, he he learned how to use email and, um, you know, it wasn't often, but he would sometimes send me a note and, you know, he's like 98 and I have a picture. I wish I had that one ready to share of him, like, you know, looking carefully at the, um, at the keyboard and um it was it was neat that he he was such an interesting and friendly person as well and and um you know of all my grandparents you know maybe the most accessible i thought that that i could really be able to talk with about about anything and it was always something to look forward to when when we would go to visit them and um yeah i mean i can't i can't think of so many personal connections that i had with my grandparents in that way, um, more of just feelings of of being, you know, inspired by them, and um, you know, really respecting respecting who they were and and the stories that that I heard of them, learning to get to know them through those stories and uh, of from my siblings and from my parents and whatnot. That's wonderful. I'm very impressed that he 
learn to navigate that technology in that way at the age of a hundred, that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, it shows a real resilience and um, flexibility and mm. um, that's so special. You were able to honor him with that song. And I'm sure that he loved that. It's very meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, since you mentioned um, church connections there, it is kind of interesting to be part of a church community and have a larger network of, of people who are wise and um, nurturing and almost like an extended family that we can look up to and learn from. And I think um, one of the unique blessings of being part of church or being in ministry too is um, learning their stories. And so um, I wanted to just take a moment to say that it, in my time at Worcester Mennonite, there are numerous um, elders who um, imparted really valuable lessons to me and to our congregation. A few that I'd like to mention specifically are um, Beulah Steiner, mm -hmm. who um, has been a part of our church for many years and is kind of um, an unofficial church historian. Like we haven't necessarily created a position called church historian as of recent, but um, she has been very intentional about um, telling the stories of our community over the years and also celebrating the stories of, of various members. There was a charter member of Worcester Mennonite named Dorcas Ross, who um, recently passed away, but she was lived to be over a hundred. And Beulah was always very good about reminding us that um, when the church started, we, we met in a home on Gashes Street and um, Roland Ross, Dorcas's um, former husband was um, an owner there of that property. And that um, the Dorcas uh, was one of those um, central figures of our church for so many years. And, and she was another person who in, later in life when we would go to visit her, she had a tablet and she could watch, um, you know, sermons and other things. She ended up connecting later in life with Salem Mennonite church in Kidron. But anytime we would connect with her, she had plenty to say, you know, for, um, her love of the people at Worcester Mennonite and her connection there. But, um, but Beulah was able to tell her story. She was able, when we had her 75th anniversary to greet so many of the people who came, um, children of, the first pastor of Worcester Mennonite, Rudy Stauffer, his children came um, oh. to the celebration, 75th anniversary celebration, and Beulah knew them and greeted them. And what I would say is that she was able to be a bridge builder and uh, interpret the early life of the congregation for the contemporary life and members. And, and without somebody to be a bridge builder, like we said before, sometimes you only learn about other people through stories because you weren't there. You couldn't experience it directly, but to be a bridge builder in that way, she helped our community find grounding. And, and we didn't even realize it. Um, <laughs> during the 75th, we were really focused on the idea of being a missional church. And we didn't realize until Beulah and until she shared with us the early stories of the church that Worcester Mennonite started as a mission. It was a mission outreach of, a Salem Mennonite church on back Orville road, a different Salem uh, close by. And it started with evangelistic meetings at the fairgrounds in Worcester and started um, in homes trying to do Sunday school programs and outreach. And then eventually when they outgrew the home on Gashie street, moving to the property where we are today on 1563 bell Avenue. And so it's just um, fascinating that, um, that somebody like Beulah would have such a love for history and that she would take the time to, to collect it and then connect it, take the extra time to connect it and, and um, build relationship with the current expression of who our church is and make sure that people um, hear this story. So I really um, appreciate Beulah. And there have been so many times when we would be in um, meetings and she would make some connection with, well, you know, 20 years ago, we had a similar topic when we were discussing um, how we were going to um, work at the partnership with Central Christian School, for example, or um, when uh, we started a, a spiritual growth group, or she had she has this wealth of, of knowledge. Um, and so um, one final thing I'll say about Beulah too is that 
for many years in the Mennonite church, at least locally in Wayne County, um, there was not a lot of interest in what you might call um, spiritual direction or um, contemplative spirituality. Maybe you could call it centering prayer. These are different terms for the, the form of spirituality that Beulah is really immersed in and loves. And for many years, she quietly served uh, as a spiritual director in our area outside of our congregation for anybody who needed one and was, was willing. Um, she led spiritual direction groups. She did a lot of work in Ohio conference. And then finally, at a certain point, it opened up at our church and she started leading prayer retreats. And um, mm. she started being a spiritual director for members of our congregation. And what I want to say is she taught me and I think so many others in our church, not only the importance of history and of an, bringing it to bear in current life, but also of patience and perseverance that if you have gifts that in one season are not welcome, or at least are not recognized as um, central or, or essential, to keep pursuing them and seeking ways to serve with them. And then maybe eventually in the fullness of time, they will become recognized and integrated in with the life of the community. So, so grateful for Beulah. And um, she's a, a, a tremendous encourager and a great example. So um, grateful for her. Thank you, Beulah. Uh, uh, and I know you probably know Beulah too from, from your time um, yeah. in the, in the congregation. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's amazing listening to this and it makes me think about just this wonderful thing about church um, how the members are always, always adding and staying and how, you know, the, it gives me this image of the people who I remember when I was little, who were kind of serving in this role of, you know, kind of, you know, they were, you know, the elderly that we looked up to and respected and they, they, you know, made, made a point to recognize us and talk with us and it had an influence on us. And then, and, you know, in my case, you know, Beulah Siner was, wasn't, wasn't at that level yet when, from what I remember, you know, she was just more of someone, oh, she's just like my parents' age, you know, and, um, and I was more familiar with, with her children and, um, you know, they were, they were older with me. And, and I, I think about the people kind of of her generation, then now as, as the years are going by and, and now she's, she's now kind of one of the, the respect for the aged, you know, that would fall into that category and, and, um, you know, even a, a more stronger pillar in the church. And, and I think about, you know, the people now who, who are kind of filling that role, you know, like that unofficial role. And, and I'm, I'm curious about, um, you know, the connections that they're forming with now the younger um, people at church. And, and I'm, I'm excited about the experiences that they had, you know, think about my own experience and then, thinking about these people like, you know, that are my parents' age now, and then thinking that, you know, these these younger people at church now are having this kind of same relationship that I had with older people that I looked up to, but I just knew them and um, through part through church. And I'm thinking about the people that, um, you know, now are playing that role um, for, for the now for the, the youngest generation at church. And it's such an exciting, fun thing about church, and and pretty unique to, um, to, to what 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 we consider church and um it's such an exciting thing about that and um yeah that that just shows really the importance of um you know taking time i think probably in the west in america you know we kind of i don't know if we kind of have the feeling of oh yeah you know i should spend more time you know um, talking with my grandparents, or I should spend more time, you know, listening to um, kind of the older people in the community. You know, it's something that I I should should do, you know. And then here in the East, where like we actually set aside a day for, you know, um, in Japan, where we set aside a day for kind of making, trying to make these connections, and where um, you know, you know, multiple generations live together in the same family, and you have this. Um, more, more connection with um, the elderly people in your neighborhood, especially in the smaller neighborhoods. Um, and then seeing seeing this, we, I, I'm just making this connection now, like in church we have that it's still alive and well, and what a great 
blessing and a great thing it is that that it does work that way. That's a really good point, Barney, that uh, we need places where intergenerational contact can happen and um, sharing and learning together across different ages is celebrated and encouraged. And I think there is a lot of hunger for that in our broader society, even if we don't speak it at a conscious level that people do, I think, always um, benefit from the presence of an older um, uh, nurturing mentors and figures who care and love and show us um, the wisdom that they've gained and and listen to us. And um, so I'm grateful that churches can serve that role. I'm grateful for um, any space that can be created for that. And um, it is inspiring too, that that is a major emphasis that seems in the culture there in Japan. That's, that's very healthy and um, we can learn a lot from it. Um, is there anything else that you might like to mention before we close our time? Yeah, it's just been such a fun time um, talking about this topic and um, I'm glad that we decided to do it. And, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really, like you say, it's one of those things that when you take the time to, to, to interact with the people um, who are a few generations older than you, you really f- realize what a blessing it is and see these people in such a different, uh, you know, a different light, see them, you know, uh, see their human side, you know, not just see them as, as a grandparent or as an older person in the community, but you, you hear all these, you learn all these things about them and realize that, you know, they went through a lot of the things in a different way that that you are going through and you've been through as well. And it's just this wonderful blessing, like you say, to learn from their wisdom in that way. Thank you, Barney. And I want to thank our listeners and viewers for being a part of our conversation today. I hope that you have been able to reflect on your own experience of grandparents or um, mentors or those who would nurture you who are older and would share their wisdom and listen to you that in hearing us um, and our gratitude for people like that, that you too could, um, could be encouraged and could celebrate that as well. And um, my hope too is that um, maybe some of the things we shared today would stimulate your own thinking and um, maybe call to mind some of the things that that you were taught or that were handed on to you by your grandparents or others that maybe you haven't thought about in a while and that that could be a blessing and a good thing. And we're always grateful to be here for this podcast and we look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you so much. And until next time, goodbye.